My name is uh, Alan McHale uh, of the History Department here at Yale. Uh, it's my uh, honor and pleasure to be hosting our uh, speaker for today, Jonathan Wrightson of the um, Yale Department of Sociology. Um, I'll just introduce Jonathan very briefly, um, and then um, uh, we will begin a discussion of his current book project. Um, I'll ask him a couple of questions to get us going. Um, and then the floor will be open uh, for questions. So please um, use the chat function um, or the Q&A function, excuse me, um, through Zoom to post a question and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, so Jonathan Wrightson is um, Associate Professor of Sociology here at Yale. Um, he is a, a unique scholar, a historian among the sociologists um, to the benefit of both disciplines, I would, I would add. Um, he received his PhD from Georgetown in 2009 um, and um, has uh, been at Yale um, since then. Um, he is well known to us here at Yale. Um, he wears many hats. He's been DUS, currently is still DUS of sociology and also of the modern Middle East studies major and has served the council um, um, in various capacities um, as acting chair as DUS um, and numerous committee posts. Um, he is the author of Making Morocco, Colonial Intervention and the Politics of Identity, published by Cornell in 2015, a prize-winning book. Um, it won the President's Book Award of the Social Science History Association, a top, a top prize, um, was reviewed widely in uh, journals in sociology, uh, history, and uh, Middle East studies, colonial studies, various fields. Um, he's published articles in um, um, IJMIS, the International Journal of Middle East Studies, in, um, in political power and social theory, and numerous other venues. Um, and Jonathan is now hard at work on a new book project um, entitled um, Reimagining the Middle East in the Long Great War, and that's the subject of our discussion um, here today. And this book um, is really monumental in its scope, offering a complete rethinking of the foundations of the 20th um, century Middle East. And, and, and the ambition um, of, of this book is really, really breathtaking. Um, there have been a spate of books published about the Great War in the Middle East, thanks to the centenary of a few years ago. And none of them, I think, do what Jonathan's book does um, in, in um, both chronology um, geography, and then most importantly, in um, rethinking the causal story of the Great War. It offers a radical departure from most of these other books, and we'll, we'll get into this more in a second. So um, very briefly, instead of nation states and colonial powers, we have a far richer account in Jonathan's book, one that includes these entities, of course, but also um, a huge array of local and regional actors, so instead of a story just of the British, the French, the Hashemites, the Ottomans, um, we have stories uh, about the Reef War in Morocco, um, the Syrian and Kurdish revolts, the Senussi War, the Ikhwan in what is today Saudi Arabia. So it's a completely different picture of uh, the Great War and then also about the implications of what that different picture means for our understanding of the modern Middle East. As Jonathan writes, quote, conflicts between competing polities produced post-Ottoman boundaries on the ground, not peace settlement pen strokes. Um, and I think one of, one of the major conceptual punches of the book is his argument that war made borders in the Middle East, not the other way um, around as we usually think about it. Um, so uh, to get us into this, I thought, uh, Jonathan, I might ask you uh, to begin by explaining uh, something that, you know, is a standard story in modern Middle East courses, uh, a story that's um, usually told about how we get the modern Middle East, um, and that's the Sykes-Picot uh, agreement. You, you refer to what you, you term the Sykes-Picot shorthand and why we need to dispense with that in favor of your wider temporal and, and geographical scope. So maybe you could start there by explaining what you mean by the Sykes-Picot shorthand and, and how you're trying to move away from it. Yeah, thanks, uh, Alan, and thank you for that synopsis. Um, I'll have you <laughs> be a nice blurb on the back of the book, because um, I think you really captured a lot of the, the the things that I'm trying to put together in the intervention. It is uh, the it's a it's an extended um, 
dismantling of what I'm referring to as the Sykes-Picot shorthand. So those of you that have taken a Middle East uh, history class, or if you're vaguely familiar with the region, you probably have heard of Sykes-Picot. It's a 1916 agreement named after the two Fr the, the French and the British diplomats that were involved in, in coming up with a secret agreement uh, between those two imperial powers for what they wanted to do with the Ottoman Empire after the war. So Mark Sykes uh, and Georges Picot um, come up with a map uh, that they define separate zones in the north, French zones of control and, and British zones of control across the south. Um, the shorthand there is uh, a bundling up of a whole series of European agreements that includes Sykes-Picot, um, but also um, kind of a whole narrative bundle that we tell about the making of the modern Middle East, which is that uh, during World War I, these secret agreements on the colonial side trumped um, to some, more or less trumped uh, other promises that were made. Uh, the most significant uh, one of those was an exchange of letters between um, Sharif Hussein and Mecca and uh, the British uh, official in charge of Egypt, McMahon. So the Ness correspondence, which promised that the Arabs could have a kingdom after the war if the British liberated the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. So this shorthand, uh, and, the, and the other significant one that we um, reference is the Balfour Declaration in which the British promised that uh, the Zionist movement, that there would be a, the British would support the establishment of a Jewish national home. Um, and the sykes go shorthand is, is basically saying that this bundle of agreements and the, the, the sort of uh, promises kept and the promises not kept is uh, effectively uh, the end result of that is that the British and the French drew uh, imposed artificial and arbitrary boundaries on the region, serving their own interests in terms of the colonial um, end game that they, they wanted to have at, at the end of the war. Um, and it basically, um, you know, between a period of these agreements in the middle of the war and then the culmination of those in the 1920 Treaty of Sevres, which is the final of the Paris Peace Conference treaties, um, so one that deals with the Ottoman Empire, that that's the effective genesis narrative. That's the origin story of the making of the modern Middle East. And the key part of that narrative that is the gotcha part of it is that there's this original sin of the British and the French um, uh, one, breaking these promises, countervening local ideas about what they wanted to have in terms of self-determination after the war, and imposing these fake borders, which now are the root of every uh, conflict from the Israel-Palestine to Iraq to the Syrian civil war, et cetera. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Um, in, in moving away from the Sykes-Picot shorthand, um, you advocate for uh, a different periodization, a different geographical <coughs> scope, um, and then ultimately um, other causes and effects. So maybe we could walk through each of those in turn. Um, you know, the standard dates for the Great War are 1914 to 1918. You advocate for a periodization that's a little bit before 1914, a little bit after. Could you maybe explain um, what you see as the right chronology? Sure. Um, so these are interlocking parts of the argument that I'm making about how we need to rethink. And so when I'm saying in the book title, reimagining the Middle East, there's a level at which I feel we need to reimagine this origin story. But the reason we need to, uh, the way that we do that is that we get back into a historical present of the early 21st, of the early 20th century and can see how on the colonial side and in the region itself, what's happening with World War I is that it's taking apart, it's dismantling uh, a prior, a longer Ottoman order that kind of anchored the center of the region, but I'm bringing in um, a scope uh, that includes the Alawite uh, zone of control in Northern Africa and what becomes Morocco uh, and, and the Qajar area. So this is a book that extends from the Atlantic to the Iranian plateau. Um, and that uh, in that, um, uh, that frame, that geographical, so this is sort of the expanding of that geographical frame, um, that we need to reimagine how the processes through which that was th that zone was remade, the political contours of that area were remade, they were reimagined um, during this period. Uh, so 
the geography, the chronology, and then changing the ways that we understand that away from a kind of top-down Eurocentric uh, imposition of these fake boundaries uh, requires those three things to kind of come together. So in terms of periodization, uh, this is a, a very much part of the, the centenary of the Great War and a lot of the work that's being done, not just on the Middle East, but also in Eastern Europe um, to uh, think of a broader scope than the Western Front and a kind of Euro, very, even a Western Eurocentric focus to the war, which is, you, know, you start the war when uh, the Ger Germany and France, that conflict actually, you know, kicks off, it, it ignores um, I mean, we start with the, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand and the way that that sets off these European alliances in the summer of 1914. And then it ends when you sign the, the armistice on the Western, uh, Western Front that ends those hostilities. Um, for the Middle East, I'm, for me, I'm changing the center of gravity of that whole story. So if you change the center of gravity to the Mediterranean basin, if you change it uh, to both of the northern shores of Africa to the eastern Mediterranean, the Ottoman Empire is in a period of warfare, of active warfare from September 28th, 1911, which is when Italy starts bombarding uh, Ottoman Tripoli. Um, earlier that spring, if, you, if you're thinking of this wider zone that I'm talking about, the French uh, from the coast of uh, Morocco, from Casablanca, move um, troops to occupy Fez. Uh, there's Spanish uh, incursions that also land on the Atlantic coast um, that start to move inland in Morocco. So that's also in the spring, summer of 1911. So really from 1911, you've got active warfare that's more or less unabated through up through 1914 because the Italo-Ottoman War flows directly, literally is absolutely interlinked and connected to the Balkan Wars, uh, which uh, changed the dynamics of that. And that sets up the whole powder keg that the Archduke Ferdinand being assassinated in Sarajevo um, as a part of uh, tensions that have to do with Balkan states, Austro-Hungary, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. Um, that whole story is, from the Middle East perspective, is, a, is a, a continuity rather than separate different periods of different uh, uh, periods of warfare. Um, and I'll maybe talk about, so what, what the other part of the argument is that 1918, so in October 20. I believe to October 28th, 1918, the Ottoman delegation, the British delegation meet on the island of Mutros on a battle uh, on a carrier and sign the armistice that stops hostilities between the Ottoman Empire and the British and the French. To say that conflict ended in the Middle East or in the, this greater Ottoman post-Ottoman sphere in October 28th, 1918 is to completely not see the facts on the ground through the 1920s into the early 1930s of again, a different phase. This isn't inter-empire uh, warfare, but it is in extensive uh, conventional warfare, airplanes, tanks, uh, uh, chemical weapons, machine guns, et cetera, that is happening. So my argument on the periodization is we have to see a period of warfare there from at least you know, something like 1911 up through the early 1930s um, and that has that reshapes how we think about what's happening on the ground because then it makes a date like uh, you know a Sykes Picot secret agreement in 1916 um, being a part of a larger uh, very contentious moment in which promises are being made, aspirations articulated, people draw things on 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 a on a map, but those things the drawing of those things does not turn them into reality. What turns them to, into reality is uh, the actual violent conflict on the ground. This is what you mentioned before. The borders are not making war in the Middle East. War is making the borders. So that they're an after effect of other things that are happening and shifting to those uh, dimensions is what uh, is the book is really focused on. Great, thanks. Um, I, th I think you did a very good job of, of talking both about chronology and geography. So, so maybe I'll ask you a couple of de more detailed um, kinds of questions. Um, you know, in the, in the introduction, you have a very productive discussion of getting past methodological nationalism, which is something I agree with you in, in the Middle East, um, we haven't done a very good job of. Um, and, and, and your book, it strikes me, offers many avenues for attempting to do that. And so one of the ways that the story of Arab nationalism, for example, has been told, and your book is, is about more than just the Arab world, as you've already discussed, um, 
but if we if we take the 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 example of Arab nationalisms of various kinds, it's usually told as a story of of, of um, literate elites um, in cities publishing newspapers, um, often traveling abroad, etc. Um, you offer a very different story that is outside of the city that is that is taking place in um, what we might call non-state spaces. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So a quick, quick quickie on the methodological nationalism. Um, part of, of the bigger project here, and I think just kind of putting this out there in case, you know, for what people might want to bring up in the Q&A. Um, in the book, what I'm trying to do is uh, explain the outcome of a proto nation state divided uh, region that is the end result of these processes that I'm talking about. Um, that's not, uh, it's not a necessary end result. I, I'm really as a, you know, as a very much of a historically oriented scholar wanting to recapture contingency. So the fact that you end up with the, the particular political map that, cons that I'm saying by the 1930s, it's more, way more consolidated than not. But before that, you have to account for a lot of multiple pathways that could have been there. Mm -hmm. I can't use that end result to tell the story of how that outcome got told. So I'm not going to tell the story of Jordan by using Jordan as the container in which I'm telling the story. I'm not going to tell Iraq. Um, so I, it, 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 that, that, it's a challenge because it's very hard to dethink and to the terminology that you're trying to use continually reinforces methodological nationalism and oh yeah just to explain methodological nationalism being a kind of presuppositional bias towards using the container of the the nation state as uh your framework for analysis so i'm thinking above the nation state this is a story of empires world war one is a war between empires every one of the actors is uh the, the major actors is an in, empire state it's not a nation state or we can talk more about the the relationship between those um, and then the, below the, the level of what we'd call the nation state, as, as you mentioned, a lot of the action here is in rural, non-urban areas, like the actual political mobilization, the military power, um, uh, the, the, these major social forces that are shaping the, the events are happening. They are, I mean, I'm not saying the urban story is not important. People, things that are happening in the city, but of course, because of the biases of how we do history, how we, what kind of records we have, et cetera, uh, these have gotten their fair due, if not more. Um, and what I'm really trying to do is balance that out. And, and uh, let's say when one of the books that this is um, in, in dialogue with would be Erez Manella's Wilsonian moment, which is doing the great move of saying the action isn't just in par Paris in 1919, 1920, the action is also in Cairo and in, 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 in these urban areas in Korea and in, in India and in China, et cetera. But what I'm saying is, yeah, okay, those urban stories of a place like Cairo or Damascus, uh, Beirut, um, these elites that are producing, you know, writing newspaper articles, uh, et cetera. Um, at this, at the, the time that that's happening in the hinterlands of, of, of Morocco or of, of, of the Latakia, the highland areas where the Alawites are in the, um, Taurus Mountains um, in uh, the hinterlands of the Arabian Peninsula. These are the actors that are actually going to drive political uh, transformations in, in the region. And they're also not, uh, so one, they're, they are using languages, they're evoking uh, concepts like nation, etc. But this is another part of the book is there's been a lot of ink spilled that is either I feel like retrospectively, retroactively justifying national identity or some sense of national identity. And for me, national identity really is in, is in no way a very, something that I even have to explain. It's, it's, it's one of, the, of, of many um, elements of collective identity that are being reimagined. And what I'm trying to account for is uh, in, in these rural spaces, how they're both and, you know, so there's two directions here. These, and you say there's not a hard line between state controlled and non-state controlled, but on a relative scale, on a, on a sliding spectrum of these places that have had higher levels of self-governance, there's like non-state spaces, but they themselves are rethinking what their political future is going to be and what kind of a, uh, entity that's going to happen, what kind of polity is their, their political lives are going to have, are, are going to uh, take place in. 
And that's dynamic. It's not a fixed uh, preference. So they're rethinking that and recalculating that over time through this period from 1918 into the early 1930s. Um, and they're shaping it. And some of them are trying to say, we just want to preserve our autonomy. Others, like Abdul Karim al Khattabi in northern Morocco, is creating a state. Ibn Saud is creating the apparatus of a modern state from the heart, the depths of a non state space. You've got like political. Um, innovation that's happening there. So I'm trying to account for that spectrum that's there. And this is a really, I think this, yeah, very much the, this rural part of that story is not just, I, I, you know, one of the things that I've said is this isn't like historiographical affirmative action, like, oh, we need to just bring in these other stories. Yes, we do need to bring these other stories, but we need to do it because the stories don't make sense if you've excluded them because they are a integral part of that whole dynamic. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I invite uh, people to start formulating um, your questions and putting them in the Q and A. Um, I'll ask Jonathan maybe maybe one more question and then we'll we'll turn to the audience. Um, I was struck by um, a formulation uh, uh, that 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 you put forward in the book of jihad slash revolt. Yeah, I'm curious about about that. This I'm curious about the slash. I'm curious about putting those two concepts together what do you mean by jihad what do you mean by revolt maybe you could dissertate a little bit on that for us yeah that's a good one um i that's a that's a part of the book that is in flux i, I it actually started off as that, that was really my organizing um principle and sort of the way that i was setting up case selection uh, uh and then the book has is, is, is been moving a bit from that but the logic behind that is back to the question about methodological nationalism. Uh, the way that I'm allowing the data, the, the, the information in the historical record to, uh, for me to select on it, I'm, what I'm using to do that is not, again, a container that I uh, am going to presume is there or not, because the containers for me are so volatile that they're 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 the they're the process that I'm trying to explain is the emergence of containers, both the political interior of that in the sense of like an order or a an emergent ability to kind of pretend to be a polity, and then the boundary story that happens on the on the edges of that. Um, so that's a really what the book is kind of dealing with in a more abstract way. But those, uh, the way that I'm kind of figuring out how those processes happen was to look at friction, to look at conflict, because as I'm saying, I'm making this argument that war makes the policies, war makes the borders. Um, uh, so that was with this selection on uh, what, you know, in the historiography, I think this is again, the biases that are expressed there, where we know things like the great Syrian revolt. We know the Palestinian revolt. We know um, the 1920 Iraq revolt. People, the actors that call something a revolt are the state actors. Um, that's their nomenclature for that. Um, it's an uprising, it's a revolt, uh, et cetera. Um, we, so the jihad part of that slash is that getting into, you know, if I'm, if I'm reading what Sheikh Saeed, this is a Kurdish leader and, uh, you know, outside north of Diyarbakir and south central, southeastern Turkey. He leads an uprising that's actually a movement against the Turkish Republic, the state consolidation that Ataturk is, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk is leading. Um, he doesn't call it a revolt. I mean, if, if you look at the, the discourse of the actors themselves is frequently using jihad as the label for what they're doing. Um, I mean, right, whether that's in Arabic or not, um, it's still, you know, this idea of jihad, but this is where it's complicated um, because of the present day, comp how complex it is to use a term like jihad. Um, it takes maybe more ink than I've spilled, uh, but, and, and, I, and I need to rethink how to, how to do that, but um, that jihad being a multivalent term as those that have studied it a lot understand um, that even has a very much of a secular or what we could, understand as a more secular than would be expected understanding of that. So this is a defensive political communitarian struggle, right? Jihad to be the struggle against an outside force that is threatening the integrity of that community. So the great Syrian revolt gets used in propaganda by the, the, the those that are uh, the, the Druze um, from the Jebel Druze or from even these the urban actors that use uh, 
this terminology of jihad, not even as a Muslim struggle. Like this is a, a multi-denomination. Uh, like you have this being used to evoke, uh, mobilize or to just kind of frame that struggle for Christian populations, Muslim populations, etc. cetera. Um, Abdul Karim al uses the discourse of jihad to talk about the Reef Republic. So this is those two sides of that, um, but it is a, a complicated one in terms of how you talk about that without, I've taken it out of the title. The, one of the working titles was um, Jihad's Empires and the Making of the Modern Middle East. Um, putting it on the title, I think it just, it can borrow trouble in terms of what, the way that that could be misread, mm -hmm. even though it might sell more books, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, all right, so um, as people are formulating the, their, uh, their questions and their thoughts, um, I wonder if you could reflect a bit on what you see as the implications of your story for thinking about the rest of the 20th century and even the 21st century. And you, you open the book with this vignette of traveling around in, 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 uh, in, in Jordan. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, if, if um, you know, you, you give us this, this, this radical reframing of how to think about uh, the period of the Great War, the Long Great War, as you call it. Um, what, what, what are the downstream implications for how we think about yeah. the 20th century and even today? Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's the, the temptation and the uh, trickiness of writing this kind of a book. So it's a centenary retrospective and it, probably more so than anywhere else on the World War I map. The Middle East uh, is a place at which the dynamics, the, the developments, the things that I'm talking about have not decreased in their resonance or their importance. It has increased over the, in, uh, you know, over the, the past decade or so. Um, so the, the, the trickiness is that you don't want to say that there is uh, just an absolute unbroken con continuous stream um, that these events directly transpose onto the early 21st century. Mm -hmm. That said, uh, I started, uh, this was a book that I, you know, kind of spun out as, you know, you mentioned I joined Yale in 2009. When I'm writing my job uh, letters, this was my second project. I said, you know, I work on the Reef Republic, the Reef War in the 1920s. I realized there's this like synchronic wave. You have, in 1925, you have military conflict from Morocco to Syria to um, uh, Kurdistan, et cetera. Um, and and it, in the, you know, finishing the first book, but then starting to get working on this book, uh, I had this idea of like, yeah, you've got, um, the Reef War, you've got the italo sanusi conflict in Libya, you have the Great Syrian Revolt, you've got the stuff that's happening in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and pretty much every one of those cases uh, shut down as I was starting to try to do the research. So I was gonna go to uh, Turkey, go to, go to Eastern Turkey and look at some of this stuff. And um, 2016, it was a, it was a sort of uh, crackdown on the Kurdish areas began. The This was, you know, before that, the Syrian conflict had uh, obviously, uh, the civil war had escalated. Uh, the Libya, Libya, you know, from 2011 becomes a place used in no go. Um, Yemen is another part of my story, and, and we know what's going on there. Um, the latest is Nagorno Karabakh. I mean, this is a, it's a peripheral part of it, but I talk about Transcaucasia and how these tensions over a potential Armenia, over Turkish, you know, aspirations. Uh, late in the war, Turkey blows right across um, to the Caspian Sea and. Um, the origins of the, the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia right now do go back um, to uh, this period. So that's my latest one. And, and, and another one, uh, just where the present and the past came together. Um, I'm going to skip over the ones that you're talking about and people can read the book and um, maybe have a surprise. It'll, it'll build some anticipation of uh, some intense moments on the Jordanian Syrian border. Um, but when I went to do to, to work on writing up this manuscript, I got a Fulbright to Morocco and my research permit was shut down um, and the all the police stations in the reef area of Morocco were notified to block me from doing anything up there because in the interim between I when I submitted this proposal which was kind of look at how the reef fits into a larger global um, period of uh, you know the, the long great war uh, the protests had started the Hirak protest out of El Hosema in the north and they're waving flags of Abdul Karim I mean, pictures of him, flags of the Reef Republic evoking this memory. Um, so this is where this 
you know, uh, I'll wrap this up. This, it's, it's a very, you know, a, a big question, but what's important or what I've realized is that the, my argument is that the end of World War I or, or the kind of long ending of World War I, on that map from Morocco to Iran, you had certain places that before the war had been colonized. So Algeria is colonized almost a century before World War I starts off. E Tunisia is colonized 30 years. Egypt is, is under Egyptian control, sorry, Egypt is under British control for about 30 years. So the, the colonial intervention, the processes, the contestation, these types of things had taken place and were more or less settled. There was intense things that happened in Egypt, obviously 1919, but it's over what's the control within Egypt rather than over what Egypt is going to be in terms of you know, its boundaries, et cetera. But the other parts of the map, Morocco, Libya, all of the Anatolia, Syria, Greater Syria, the Arabian Peninsula, et cetera. The rest of that map, let's, well, maybe we're bracketing off Iran. Um, that's up for grabs. And there's fault lines, there's tension, there's contestation that happens at those points on the map. Those points on the map eerily are pretty much the same points that right now are have flared back up and are are in this uh, this moment of really volatile contention and, and of um, kind of, uh, you, you know, like, I, again, it's not a pure state or another, it's a sliding scale, but between what I call you know, like more of a static and a more volatile emergent phase, these are on this side of this again. There's periods in the middle of that story that they're not, but what's happened, we've kind of come back. So, I mean, to be provocative, I mean, and, and what I need to wrestle with in the conclusion is like, is the, are we in a really, really long, great war? Like, is this, is, are we still in the long, great war right now? I mean, I don't think that's a, you know, a, a, a easy, facile, yeah, sure, it's exactly the same thing, but there are, it is the kind of questions we have to ask about the continuities. Um, and, and there's a, why I talk about this idea of like, you know, just obviously history doesn't repeat itself, but there's these rhyming schemas, the rhymes, the rhymes are happening on the map at those places. So we can move to some questions maybe now. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Yeah, we have a, a few questions, keep them coming. Um, um, our dear colleague, Marcia Inhorn asks, in writing 20th century uh, Middle East history from below, focusing on the rural hinterlands across an expansive Middle Eastern landscape, what kinds of sources did you draw upon? For example, in your last book, Making Morocco, you relied heavily on Berber poetry, including women's poetry. Could you speak about where you search for source material for this broader history? Yeah, thanks, Marcia. That's a really, that's a great question. Um, uh, so, on one side, I picked a subject. I mean, I, I decided to, to set up a, a story that, that that goes from Morocco to the border, uh, you know, Herat or somewhere. Um, and in terms of the ways that I, if I had multiple lifetimes, the things I would have liked to do, um, if I also had access, would have been to get um, a ton of that kind of material. Uh, it's also, I'm trying to keep it as a 200 or under page book. Um, so I'm making choices uh, very selectively about how I bring that in. And, and I don't have the space to tell as, I mean, just to be, to, to be honest, the scope I'm putting, trying to put in accent points of that texture of that, uh, the, the story from below um, with the actual, um, the voicings that, that are coming out of that. But I would, uh, it, it's, it's a different kind of a book, so it doesn't have the degree of that. I think the, the, the macro, very much the same spirit that's happening is what we were talking about before, um, in which really the focal point, uh, again, this is uh, not a story from, I, I, the way that I think of this is the kind of stories we need to tell is not replace the top-down story with a bottom-up story. It's reframe the whole story by putting in these pieces uh, that are you know, from below or that are from, from rural populations, as I said before, not because, um, I, I know this maybe not the right way to talk, but it's not like uh, just uh, historical af affirmative action just on its own sake, but analytically uh, it's, it has to happen. Um, and I think in that, so, I would say what's really dropped off quite a bit is the gender. I just didn't get the same, I mean, not near the texture that I got um, and, and the richness of the sources that I have there. But I did have, um, I mentioned the places that I couldn't go to. I wanted to go to Libya because Muammar Gaddafi did a huge oral history project. 
uh, with these recordings um, in the 1980s of the story of the resistance. So he inter interviews men and women from the 1920s. It's in this repository and it's, I, I don't know what's going on with that, if it even if it still is uh, has survived the conflict there. Um, places I did get to go, or a lot of the backwards way to try to get into this is, for example, the archive of the Reef Republic. So like of different kind of a state archive. This is this five year or so um, uh, period, uh, an entity that survives that or, or, or exists that long um, that uh, was, a bunch of files that were on the person of Abdul Karim. He gets captured by the um, French in, uh, I believe, May 1925. And they took all of that back to France. And so I was able to get into that archive and actually see the documents, the correspondence, et cetera, of the, that part of the story. Um, we could talk about, I mean, I think subalternity and, and uh, marginalization is always relative. Uh, so relative to the French state archives, et cetera, the, uh, Reef Republic archives are from a relative position of marginality. Um, but I, as much as possible, I'm trying to put in those parts of the story too. Great, thanks. Um, Daniel uh, Tavana has a question. You mentioned in your <coughs> comments that the nation state was but one of the many different collective identities imagined in this period. Yeah. Can you tell us more about the processes through which these alternative identities were made manifest uh, or from imagined to real? Um, and how did these processes vary across the region? Um, okay, on the, the, just a kind of an inventory of different entities that are imagined. Um, if I'm gonna maybe kind of start from smaller to bigger. Um, you, you definitely have uh, some of these areas in which they're basically trying to maintain some sort of local autonomy that the level of, you know, from a village level or just a, sort of a, a larger networked, um, maybe, you know, it could be a tribal sort of an orientation uh, that really what they're trying to preserve is they've always existed in some sort of relationship to a state, pow state power out there, but maintaining high degrees of their local autonomy. So not really changing that so much, although pretty much everybody in the period that I'm talking about, that becomes untenable. That's part of the, the, the grand shift that is happening across the region. And it's an epical shift, uh, at least for, up, you know, for a century up till the present. Like it's impossible not to think of this in a certain way because that's untenable. Um, then you do have, um, you know, I, I think there's these, uh, again, not in the modality of the nation state, um, ideas of collective political identity that, uh, you know, at the other end of that is a kind of reimagined Ottoman, a post-war, an Ottoman entity that exists, that, I mean, sorry, that, that survives, and not just for Turks, um, not just for Turks and Kurds, but for some kind of an Arab, Ottoman, um, blended kind of mixed imperial framework with high degrees of local autonomy on, on the Arab side of that. Um, then, you know, Michael Provence has a great book that really gives you the just beautifully textured, fine grain kind of uh, data on that, on these Ottoman Arab officers and the kind of visions that they have. There's a very much of an imagination. One of the things that I track is uh, what, what did the people in Bladishan, so the greater Syria, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, Palestine, um, what are they thinking in 1919? And one of the things that I would emphasize is the ways that they're not, nobody's just sitting there and saying, this is our one preference. We have one fixed idea of what we want after the war. They have ranked preferences and those get recalculated over time as they become thinkable and unthinkable, as they're possible, as they're impossible. So if there's people, you know, most of the people want an Arab kingdom under Faisal, something that includes and with maybe some autonomy for parts of, of Lebanon, for greater Lebanon, um, you know, obviously people are thinking of, you know, Zionists aren't even full-blown thinking of what happens there. They have an idea of some kind of a protected autonomy, a national home that does have a, some trajectory towards that. Um, in Cyrenaica, they have had for decades and decades a quasi sanusti networked state-like thing that includes coordination, communication, revenues, uh, et cetera. And I don't know what you call that. It's a, some, you're right, they, you know, it's not a nation state. Um, so I think that's a part of it, that inventory is, is what I'm trying to put into that. 
Um, even the, this is the other side of this I want to emphasize is the colonial powers themselves did not sit there and say, let's, you know, in 1916, Sykes and Picot are not drawing up what happens in the Middle East. They're thinking of zones of direct, more and less direct control. They're thinking of an international uh, area for Jerusalem and for much of Palestine. They're giving parts of the Straits to Russian zones uh, of control there, of influence. Um, the British in Iraq think of India style forms of direct and indirect rule, a Northwest province of kind of a tribal administration. Like they have, I think this is the, the, the real task here is this historicization of all the different across this huge spectrum there. Um, when you say that, I, I'll, I'll wrap up to move on to another question, but from imagine to real, um, and this is, the, this is, I think it's a crucial question and important question is um, that separation between imagining and I guess part of when I'm using the word imagine obviously it's Benedict Anderson's imagined communities etc but it's a it's a thought of it's the way you can think of a future so what does that mean what's real what's imagined um the the realities of this is that over the period of time that I'm tracing the reality and what that means is like the the hard re realities of taxation of a maybe you know, eventually a monitored border that stops tribes from being able to raid uh, rampantly across uh, mm -hmm. some kind of a, a imagined uh, physical boundary. Um, like there, there are tangible effects there, you know, educational administration, those kinds of things that they become real through state processes of like the actual, the state is physically there in, in, in ways um, that they weren't before. Um, I may, maybe I'll stop there and, and we can go to some of the other questions. But yeah, it's, that's a, you're right in the heart of what the book is trying to lock down, Daniel. Thank you both. Um, former uh, chair of the council, Frank Griffel asks, um, if you talk about a long-term perspective of World, uh, of World War I and contextualize it to hostilities that happened between the period from 1911 to the 1930s, why then not contextualize it in colonial warfare overall? which began in 1798 and continued through the 19th century in Algeria in 1830, the Caucasus in the 1850s, the Indian uprising in 1857-58, Tunis, Egypt, etc. cetera. Um, in 1914, the regions of the Ottoman Empire were together with Iran, the last Muslim territories not directly ruled by Europeans. Yeah, um, that's a great question, Frank. Uh, I think, uh, so the first chapter uh, is, uh, titled um, Geostrategic Questions, Colonial Scrambles and the Road to War. And it does, it does get into that deeper story of uh, a long 19th century uh, at which the, the sort of, you know, the Islamic, hit, like a Hutchins terms, like a, a Morocco to, to India uh, sphere of Af Africa and Asia is, is, this is the long, processes that are happening are the colonial expansion, the, the expansion of these European colonial powers in that area. So I do account for that. And I, and I, account, I, I kind of frame the, uh, the opening act of World War I being, you know, and this is, you know, common to, to, to do that. But what I'm trying to accentuate is um, the, uh, those moves are being made, and um, I can't write a book that encompasses the whole story that, that you're talking about. And, and I think, you know, as, as a historian, you're always drawing a line somewhere. It's like, hey, I'm, this is really the starting point for this story, and, and you're making an argument about periodization. Um, the periodization that I'm interested in is the end game story, uh, the, sorry, the end game chapter of the story that you're talking about that goes way earlier. And what I, the one tweak I would say is that what I'm saying is in 1911, the Alawite Morocco, Ottoman uh, Anatolia, part of, you know, still part of the Balkans, North Africa, Arabian Peninsula, et cetera, and the Qajar areas are technically autonomous, right? Mm -hmm. Whole degrees at which their sovereignties are being infringed upon very much by that point, but they're, they're more or less autonomous from 1911 to 1930 that entire system is gonna be unmade and then remade. And that's the part of the chapter that I'm looking at over the story. I, I agree with the kind of thrust of what you're saying there, but that's the way that I'm just saying that is that 1911 is a start of the unmaking of that order. Um, so Morocco uh, in progressively through that period, the Ottoman empire through that period and Qajar Iran is gonna be also transformed by that. Um, 
Um, if I could just maybe piggyback on, on yeah. from this question, because, uh, you know, uh, there's the question of chronology, but there's also the question of, of geography. And so maybe you could speak a little bit to your choices about sort of who's in and who's out. I mean, one yeah. could have, you know, the Balkans seem to be a part of the story. <laughs> and, you know, with, with the Ottoman Empire, obviously that makes sense. It's less hard, it, it, it's, it's less easy to see how that's a part of, uh, of a Middle East story. Um, you know, Iran is in, you, you mentioned the caucus. I, I'm interested in the kind of yeah. zones that are one foot in, one foot out, a place like Mauritania, for example. Um, yeah. um, Yemen is a part of your story. How does Sudan fit into this? Uh, maybe just, just speak a little bit to, you know, the, what you see as the borders of your story. Yeah, again, um, balancing between just the, the straight up uh, practicalities and limitations yeah. of what I can and can't do, but there, but I have thought through, um, you know, more of a justification uh, than that um, feasibility justification. I, I think that the the the, the more, um, you know, the, the the reason that this the con contiguities of this re region that I'm defining as, uh, and I you know kind of go back and forth on what the nomenclature is. I'm calling it a a greater Ottoman zone because I do tack on, you know, I'm a you know, I have the Morocco story and part of for what I'm doing is saying is this is there's ways in which there's real connectivity between North Africa and this zone that extends to the Iranian plateau, both in the context of that 19th century great game story because Morocco's right as one of those key nodes that's uh, in play with the great power struggles. Um, and uh, Iran, in terms of British, Russian, um, Aden, Yemen, like the, the Suez Canal, etc. Um, the edges of that. So I got pushed back as like, I was not, I was stopping the story at, at like Iraq and, and I got pushed back. It's like, why not Iran? I'm like, yeah, because a lot, I said, yeah, right. Um, it needs to have that part in it. Why not Afghanistan? Um, that would be the one that I would ha maybe have more trouble with. I, I think the issue with Sudan, just to kind of take that one off is that it's, it is settled like 1898 that, um, it's on the edge of my story. And I'm, I'm bracketing off Egypt and Tunisia and, and Algeria. And I try to explain why I'm doing that. Again, that, that, the basics of that the explanation is that, yes, all of these things are in play, very much similar stories, but it's happened and it's settled, more settled than not before 1911. Could push me on that, but I think, you know, the Mahdist, the, the, that, that's a very, you know, much my story. It's in an earlier phase let's say the chapter before the chapter that I'm looking at. So that's why I would block that off. Afghanistan is the one, and, and maybe I need to just, I, I'm, it gets sketchier, right? The, 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 the detail on, in this story is in these spaces, Morocco, uh, Libya, uh, um, and then the Ottoman core. Uh, the Balkans come in and out. They're in focus a lot in the front, and then they drop out because they're, they've, the Balkan cry, you know, the, the the, the, by 1930, in, in, in the midst of World War One, the inter-empire period of World War One, 14 to 18, they're they're re they're relevant. They're relevant when Greece occupies Western Anatolia and pushes in. But by 19, I don't keep tracing the Balkans through the end of the 1920s. That story shifts. So the focal length is not equally applied to that whole geography over the whole point. I definitely shift away from the Balkans, but I think they're they're integral because the, the whole thing is rests upon that. It doesn't rest on other Sudan and, and arguably it doesn't rest on Afghanistan. Afghanistan is happening more out of the logics out of uh, South Asia. And it's, con it's the connecting point and it's iffy. Like I, I do have some references to that because the British are thinking across, you know, what they're doing in Iraq is, a, is connected to a, an equation that includes Persia in their mind, uh, Afghanistan and India. Okay. Um... Marshall Watson, a graduate student from history, writes, um, in more forcefully emphasizing contingency and negotiation over methodological nationalist approaches, can you highlight a particular story or piece of evidence, archival or otherwise, that surprised or overturned your own working assumptions of the broader modern Middle East story you were seeking to retell? Uh, I love that question, Marshall. Yeah, that's, uh, and I know the story, I have very clear memories. I was working in the British Library and I'm just flipping through a, log of the reports coming uh i mean i think it was the agent in Jeddah, or it, it had these it's it's british the british colonial mind it's these agents that are in the 19 through from like 21 through 25 26 um so on one hand uh the the piece that stands out to me is 
I thought my presumption was that the colonial, the British and the French were going into this and they were, they had an interest in like, let's just demarcate the boundary between the Hejaz and Jordan, Transjordan. Let's make sure this border between Transjordan and Mandate Syria is clear or in between Iraq and all, you know, those things that the colonial actors were like, that was their agenda. They wanted to draw a line on the map. I was saying, arguing like Sykes-Picot didn't do it, but this was a, the state logic is to territorialize and cartographically define state space. What I exactly in answer to your question, what really transformed that is as I'm reading through this is that the colonial, those colonial actors did not have that agenda. They didn't want to mess with the cost of enforcing a border of, of keeping this tribe from doing that. They're, they're just so fed up with Ibn Saud's inability to keep, keep these Ikhwan tribes that are just rampant. I mean, they're just doing, they're just moving across the space. They're, they're constantly having to deal with the attacks. Um, you know, Ikhwan actually go into Amman um, 1924 um, and, and raid that. They're going into Kuwait um, through the late 1920s. So the fact that the colonial actors didn't, that wasn't their agenda and that this is driven by the other side, that this is driven by the expansion of the Saudi state. This would be one, one example. The Saudi state is expanding through the 1920s, forces the British to create the map that we have today. Those borders that you have between Saudi Arabia, et cetera. Um, I mean, the British are just sort of like, there's a kingdom of the Jaws, let's let that go. Let's let the Sultan of the Naj go. Like the, the facts on the ground, the developments on the ground from below in, that, in this schema. Um, very similar story. Um, the Italians literally build a 400 kilometer wall. Uh, it's not a wall, it's a fence between on a border between Libya and Egypt because the Senussis are just using the strategic depth that they have in the Egyptian Western desert. So that's a huge thing, my entire story. I had to rethink the entire thing I was doing several years back because of just sitting there and reading through those things. And it, yeah, it blows up the methodological, whatever the, whatever, the non-state spaces and the relationship to state spaces flipped my story a lot. Okay, well, exactly on that topic, we have another question. Um, can you speak a bit more about how you approach theoretically or methodologically the idea of non-state spaces? I'd be most grateful to know what scholars or particular works influenced your own understanding of how to approach these spaces and geographies in a physical, temporal, mental, and infrastructural sense. Uh, yeah. Um, I've been really influenced by uh, James Scott or Jim Scott here at Yale. Uh, I push back on James. So James Scott is a political science anthropologist uh, and uh, has written extensively on this idea of, of non-state space in Southeast Asia. And so um, for like at least a decade now, I've been like really working out ways in which what he's talking about in Southeast Asia do and don't work in the greater Middle East. Um, so that would be one, um, uh, you know, geographers, uh, and I have a partner who's a geographer and they have, they think in so much more sophisticated ways about space and about, um, about these questions uh, that uh, you're, you're asking. Um, so, um, that's, a, you know, there's, there's a, uh, we could maybe go offline if you want to email me directly about that to, to talk about those, um, uh, some of those, those thinkers that we could, could do. I mean, the idea of producing space is, is a, you know, the French uh, thinker Lefebvre talks about that instead of uh, space being a background container it actually being the active uh, and actively constructed, like a socially constructed entity um, that's a shift that geographers do that the rest of us, you know, can jump on onto a, a, a bandwagon that's like much further down the road. Um, and I think we're all kind of getting into, um, re again, part of this process of rethinking uh, what we're even talking about. And so making, um, problematizing um, uh, this concept of uh, state and non-state spaces there. I mean, you, you know, this is may sound corny, but I'm a North Africanist. Ibn Khaldun talks about this binary, not a binary, but he talks about this relationship between state actors and non-state actors in the 1300s. Um, and, uh, you know, he's another place, he's like from, for a very long time being aware of his whole paradigm of political history. And I think this is one of the places in which um, he has a very important uh, uh, intervention against what James Scott says is that Ibn Khaldun's model is that these two things exist, but um, 
the story isn't just a grain-based massive state structure that keeps trying to capture these outlying non-state spaces. The story in Ibn Khaldun's model is those outlying non-state spaces actually are the have the military cohesive the, the cohesive social cohesiveness and military capabilities to with they have the force to create the state spaces. So he looks at this interacting model. Um, so that's I think you know that's a little bit to talk along those lines. Um, it's a really really good question. Um, I think the other thing is the, the constructedness of uh, one of the things I'm getting to and trying to think about how to represent is. Um, that how to capture the fluidity of how people, uh, both on both sides that I'm really interested in, the colonial side and the local side. I'm trying to think of this. If you're in Palestine uh, from 1915 to 1935, like what's happening in your mind as you're thinking of your political space? It's a very that's a complicated story, and it it's maybe back to some of those other things I'm talking about. Um, if anybody's about to drop off, just like the take home message here. Um, this is a long discursus that is proving that uh, borders don't make war in the Middle East. And my overall, you know, the straight up punchline is the problem with Palestine, let's be the extreme example, uh, going out on what I don't think is even that much going out on a limb. The problem there is not the borders. The problem with Palestine has very little, if nothing, to do with the borders of Mandate Palestine. It's what happens inside the borders. The problem with Syria. We could talk about Lebanon, but more or less isn't the borders of Syria, it's politics. And the story of the politics is a, the other part of this book, but um, how politics have happened, how they've been allowed to develop and not, how they've been interrupted um, is really the important dimension here. And I think this is connected to some of the, the uh, points that you're bringing up there. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. I think that's a perfect ending point. Um, this right. was a really, really fruitful and productive discussion that I enjoyed a great deal. Thank you so much for um, answering all of these questions and for Absolutely. the discussion. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Yeah. thanks everybody for coming and uh, I wish you all a very happy afternoon.